Hello, everybody. Welcome back for another episode of the Stokes Sound podcast. I'm your host, Ed Stokes, and today we have Josh Ager. Josh has worked with the likes of Sam Fender, Tom Grennan, Kate Cannon, and many more. Josh, how are you doing? Feel free to introduce yourself a little bit. Um, Hello, Ed. Yeah. Oh, you're going to make me blush. <laughs> it's really, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's great, great to be here. Thank you for inviting me on. Um, yeah, you said, you said say a bit about yourself. What do I say? Um, <laughs> I'm a mixer. Anything you want. <laughs> I'm most, well, yeah. <laughs> I'm, a, I'm yeah I'm a mixer mainly I think that that is you know probably what I would go with when when people ask me that now obviously I could sort of delve into bits of production and engineering like we all do but I mean you know the the main thing for me is mixing which is awesome you know I'm very lucky to be able to do that every day um as as are you fantastic and I wanted to bring you on the show because this episode is all about um effects so reverbs and delays in mixing and josh as you're a fantastic mixer i thought you're going to be the guy for this so you can speak to our listeners or not speak or tell our listeners um (laughs) you know how do you go about effects in mixing and you know i've put you on the spot here but you know if we take vocals for example because that's one thing that everybody seems to want to know you know what reverb do i go for and you know, decay time and all of that kind of stuff. So if you can just give us a little bit of insight about kind of what you do in your workflow uh, when it comes down to choosing effects. Yeah, totally. Um, Well, I guess the place to start with that would be obviously listening to the rough mix, looking at the stems that you've been given. If the producer, you know, a lot of the time they will send you an affected lead vocal stem you know from sometimes you have to guess <laughs> what they've got going on or you know if you were lucky they'll send you a reverb stem and a delay stem and a like sometimes they use micro shift and things like that so it's a lot of the time i find it very useful to be able to start from where they left off a lot of the time i will be sticking to what i've been sent or at least taking that as an inspiration for what I'm going to do. So say if they're using a plate reverb, I'm like, that's cool, but I want to use something with a bit more character, or you know, I want to try something else. A lot of the time I will be using blends of something similar, or blends of something completely different. But it's just all about, you know, enhancing the vibe that's already been given to me as a mixer. You know, unless it's a completely blank slate. And, you know, I've had that conversation beforehand um i will often be sort of starting from where someone left off yeah um which is awesome it's just you know it's cool to be able to do that so a lot of the time for me it will be putting reverbs or artistic choices or production choices in a place where it can you know speak and be unique but also enhance it if that makes sense yeah i guess you experiment as well so i'm just trying to you know if we just take like a vocal stem for example Let, let's mm. say they hadn't provided a, a vocal stem reverb um mm. would what would your go-to be in that sense of course every track is different and you know things change um but like for me for example i tend to always lead to vocal plates or, or plates uh, mm. on vocals i mean do you kind of do a similar thing or are you or do you have your favorite reverbs and if so what are they yeah, I probably should have led with that, shouldn't I? That's what I've been thinking a lot about using other people's stems lately. Um, my favourite reverb is probably the thing I always go to first is Seventh Heaven. I don't know if you have that one. I do. It's my favourite. Um, <laughs> unbelievable. Oh, well, there you go. Yeah. Um, I I tend to go to whatever the sort of default is on the smaller one, not the big one. Yeah. For some reason, um, I think it's like a plate or a hall or something like that. Um, it's about a second and a half long, maybe. Yeah, that's where I start because it's like a real like bread and butter, nice posh reverb. Yeah. Um. So I tend to start there. I have three, three sort of reverb vocal sends in my template that I go to. The first one is a sort of um. It's normally like an emulated reverb, so like a Seventh Heaven or a Four Eighty or a Two Two Four, like a digital reverb. Yeah. So that tends to be my first one. And then the second one will be like the more natural stuff like plates. I really like Capital Chambers. UAD. Which gets used a lot. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. 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 Or the EMT, the uh, 140, gets used all the time. So I sort of have a vibey one like that, something more natural. And then my third one 
uh, is sort of like the wild card okay. channel on which I usually the main thing that gets used on that is the air spring reverb. I don't, do you, yeah. you you mixing in Pro Tools? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Spring reverb. Yeah, love it. It's great. Yeah, that's that's the one. I mean, it's, it sounds horrible. Um, I love it. It's just really <laughs> like, you, crusty, you... like mono thing. I'm using that on a send quite a lot just to get a bit of grit back into vocals because a lot of the time you clean things up so much that it's nice to just reintroduce a little bit of chaos and that's that's a really like good way to do it in my opinion. Are you blending? So are you saying, so let's say you have a, a dry vocal, are you blending, you know, multiple reverbs into the vocal of of course it depends on the song but if you're just talking generically would you use a few reverb sends yeah on? generically i'll have i'll have sends rather than having one send and then um balancing the return i'll have like a, you know three or four maybe five effect sends off of my vocal and i'll obviously you know automate that with trim automation throughout the song automate the return and you can obviously you've got so much control over how you push in and out of each reverb in that um configuration so in in my experience i i find it much easier to work like that fantastic and um some people had some questions and it was regarding kind of using effects on uh more percussive stuff um like mm -hmm. drums and stuff are you do you find that you're so let's say you've got an acoustic drum kit are you using like a reverb across the whole kit and then something different for the snare or or effects wise delays and snare as well do you tend to do much of that yeah, I mean, there's not much that does like a natural ambience on a drum kit that well for me. I really like the Ocean Way yeah. plugin. That's in my template for drums, often when I'm just using a drum kit. I love um, Valhalla Room for that, the dark yeah. chamber or the dark room. I just like dark reverbs, really. Yeah. Do you filter um, the them main a lot? Thing on drums for me. <laughs> I always feel like yeah. whenever I'm using a reverb, I'm taking out all that low end and all that high end. Just get that kind of yeah, man, it's all, middle all mid range. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. And that's that's a big thing with reverb is sort of um, building vividity. Um, there you go. There's a word for you in sort of <laughs> mid range, like low, like three hundred to four hundred, even up to five hundred. You know the the but you know the the frequencies that everyone seems to hate yeah they're so important i think for vibe and space and depth so um i mean especially for me lately one of the things i've really trying been trying to focus on is how i'm presenting that area and a massive thing for that is making sure your spaces your depth and you know all of your reverbs and effects are sitting right and doing the right thing yeah um and uh, you know what the, the people that get that right you know like your mannies and your serbans and people like that their mixes are always so everything's so beautifully placed you know front to back left to right and i think that is a lot of the time because of the reverbs they're using and the spaces they're using so that's something i've really been trying to focus on lately is how i'm presenting my effects and you know what they're doing to like enhance the the feeling of stuff because obviously you know that's way more important than the way it sounds it's interesting because when you talk about effects, it's, it's literally like, you know, when you're at school and you're in a science class and you've got a science project, <laughs> it's like every mm. single song is like a science project of effects on how to create that depth um, in the mm. mix. So it's interesting. And do you find that you're using kind of any like wideners or any kind of stereo imaging across any of your effects at all in your workflow? Um, yeah. Sometimes well, I think the more sort of wild effect stuff I do, I also in my template I have some sort of vocal throws yep. set up. So I have like a reverb throw with like it's always Valhalla, like of course the Shimmer <laughs> or um yeah that or the you know an Echo Boy or something. You know I always have delays, and then what I would do after that is I'll you know go go to town on it. So I will maybe use like an S one to like make it really wide, or I will stick loss. You know lossy. Do you have that plugin? Lossy, I'm it's like um who makes it it's the same people that make the wolfpec compressor um they've it's basically a plugin that will just make fuck up your is that, make is it, that make it good sound. hurts good yeah, yeah yeah that's the one yeah 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 it will make it it make it make it sound like a really bad mp3 and it's got like different algorithms of that so what i will often do if i've got a, an effect return and more on delays than reverbs is i will sort of I know turn up the loss as it were so it would make it sound more lo-fi and then yeah. sort of blend that in a little bit and it makes it 
you know, obviously less clear, but it sits it in a way that is kind of, you know, horrible. It's it, it's good to have a contrast between really lush things like plates and whatnot and, you know, really crusty old reverbs like D-verb and the spring I was talking about, you know, it's it's good to sort of mess with that in whatever way you can. So yeah, stereo widening for that it's is great, a big thing. It's great me. stuff you're saying, especially for the listeners listening, because I think a lot of the mixing engineers, we all try and make things so clean and so kind of, I guess, pretty sounding to the ear that when you do focus on the effects, like what you're saying, Josh, it's it's nice to kind of make them more gritty and more dirty. So when you do make something mm. clean, you have that impact in an effect and not necessarily the actual source um, of, the, of the audio. So it, it's it's interesting to kind of hear your, your view on, on using effects. Um, and do you find in your workflow... For example, let's say you've got an acoustic version, like an acoustic guitar and a vocal. Do you find that you're mm. sharing the same effects on the acoustic guitar as you are with the vocal? Because that's talked about a lot. Like, you know, the famous thing yeah. is to say, oh, if I use a vocal plate reverb on a acoustic guitar and a, and a singer, I'm going to use the same vocal plate reverb on the guitar. What's kind of your view on that? Um, it's an interesting question. A lot of these are oddly things I've been thinking about quite a lot recently. I've chucked um, you right into the deep end. So you take, have. Take your I time. Just, you, can see my, you can see my brain going at a million miles an hour. Um, <laughs> well, if I'm building the session, if I'm doing the production, if I'm building something from scratch, I don't tend to have things sharing reverbs. So the way my mix is set up is that I have a drum bus. You know, if the mix is bigger, I'll have like an individual bass bus or a guitar bus and keys and vocals and backing vocals and a lot of the time each individual group will have its own effects returns which will go to that bus so they, they don't really touch each other okay so a lot of the time what i will do if i receive a session that's got say shared reverbs um you know between a vocal and a guitar that's what you're talking about yeah um I will, There's I will a lot of information. So, <laughs> I'll duplicate it so they, they both have their own. So it'd be the same reverb, but I can tweak it if I want to. Yeah. Because you know, a lot of the time I'm changing things like on Valhalla, it's got the 70s and the 80s preset. The difference between them is so massive to me and it's so useful to be able to have the 70s kind of more earthy, vibey one and then the 80s one, which sounds quite a lot more digital, a lot, a lot more like glassy to me. I can only really use those like sort of vague descriptive words. But it's really useful to be able to say you have a guitar and a vocal going to the same reverb. It's good to be able to differentiate between the two. So say you have the guitar reverb a bit more earthy and then the vocal one a bit more forward you know it, it's just it's another one of those things that really helps to get that sort of clarity in the mix without you know over cleaning and making it sound clinical yeah so it's really good to have for me it's really good to have lots of control about over where my effects are going and you know individually you know yeah. I, mean? I, I tend to I tend to do things as sort of in isolation as I possibly can. Fantastic. It's interesting because I feel like a lot of mixers can overthink this. You know, us as mixers, we're always trying to kind of do new things or, or like I said earlier, make things clean. And I think it's, I think you have to kind of paint a picture of what you want it to sound like and then and then do it. So I think as a listener, like what you're saying mm. is you just have to kind of vibe, vibe with it, I guess. Um, yeah. And, you know, and like you say, being able to adjust the effects on separate buses, um, you know, if you duplicate the reverb, so you've got one for the guitar and one for the vocal, yet the same reverb, but enabling you to uh, adjust it. I think it's a, you know, a great thing um, that everyone should be doing really because you are giving yourself more yeah. kind of power. Um, it's a bit of a fail safe as well, you know, because if you're you you know you sometimes you solo a vocal and you're sort of tweaking it and you're you know thinking about the reverb and you change the length or you change the pre delay or you know there's so many little variables. Yeah. You change it and then suddenly you put it put it back in and something's changed and like what's going on? Like it's for me it's really good to just have each thing doing its own individual thing and you know the the glue and the vibe and the keys and this just comes from keeping a keen eye over how everything is interacting with each other rather than things sharing processing. That's one word. Yeah, organization. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. My sessions my sessions are pretty meticulously organized. You know, it's it's nice yeah. to open a session and 
from three years ago or from last week and they look exactly the same and you know where everything is and you can see what you've done. I think that's so important. That's why workflow is so important. Like you say, you've already got kind of your go-to reverbs that you use and that you know that you know work. And kind of that also brings us on to like delays and stuff. Um, I think delay mm. is probably one of the most powerful tools, I think, as well, as far as being able to create effects in a mix. I don't know about you. I personally use more delay than reverb in mixing if I want to create more of a of a space although reverb does create a space i feel like i can kind of get similar things with a delay as well um, without it sounding too messy so you know josh give us your thoughts to the listeners as well are you more of a delay person are you more of a reverb person um oh, it's so hard to choose isn't it um <laughs> i'm going in there with the questions I, I would i would say i'm more of a reverb person okay right but i've got a weakness for slap delay like like it's like one of my biggest especially when i'm working with bands or to be honest anything i'm always getting told to turn the slap delay down that's so always. interesting you say that because i'm always putting it on guitars and i'm always really? putting it on vocals because it just makes things sound really edgy you know what i mean like i'd like a hundred millisecond slap or like kramer tapes the big one for that for me he's in a you yeah. know, kind of distorted like vibey thing and i'm always making it too loud well yeah, in other people's opinion, I would turn it up given half the chance. Um, <laughs> I love the way it makes things feel, the way you can make things feel with like a, a quick delay or a short reverb or a bit of pre delay. It's, it's crazy how different you can make something feel. Amazing. I mean, so, that's mad you said about slap delay because I've been using the Mook, Mook DSP E300, I think it is. They've got like oh, a, okay. a cool tape uh, plug in and. Um, I do similar thing, put, put a slap delay on the vocal, for example. And sometimes I like it. And then sometimes I'm like, oh, it just sounds a bit phasey. I'm not sure what's going on. So it's interesting that you're saying that you keep adding more slap because the last few mixes I've done have actually been doing less slap than ever. <laughs> so, uh, oh, really? I mean, what kind of, uh, I mean, I are you just myself. using one slap or are you using multiple slap? I, I mean, tell us your kind of process. Really I know. I, you know, with delay especially, I will be going, I'm sorry to everyone that's ever, you know, when, you, when you're at uni and college, like, you know, you have to do your effects on sends because it's just, because you should. And he's like, no, you don't. I always do my reverbs on the channel yeah. or my um, or my delays on the channel. Reverbs tend to be more on sends, you know, especially yeah. with things like vocals. But if I'm working on guitars or drums or basically, you know, I just do it on the channel because you get so much, you, you've got so much more flexibility, A, with just having it on the channel and the mix control, but then after you can compress it more or you can EQ it again or you can distort it or you can, there's so much you can do. Yeah. Um, and, a lot, you know, a lot of things happen by accident, which is the best way for things to happen so I, I tend to do these things on the channel yeah and you know a lot of the time maybe it's getting compressed more afterwards which is in turn making it louder but i i love the sound of things just feeding into other things and like gluing together and feeling really sort of it's just vibey i like do you it. ever get lost I, in I, that i enjoy though. slap delay oh yeah every day <laughs> every day that's Sounds why like you're going so through like your own world of delays before it's yeah like... <laughs> man we love it i've got to put it on everything just in case it's good you know why not <laughs> um, I... yeah lots of slap delay lots of slap delay if i if i can get away with it do you use um because I, I, i've been using lately the uh, i think it's the vahala space modulator i think it is i think it's that one they've got a cool kind of chorus effect which is like a like a mm. wide chorus which is kind of acting like a, a slap delay um you should try that. Try. I mean, I don't know if you use choruses and vocals. I will try that but... one. I yes. I always, always, always have a um, a widener thing. Yeah. Call it. A lot of the time now, it's waves doubler, which I guess you could say is a delay. Similar, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. Similar sort of thing. That or like a micro shift. Yeah, that's um, similar again, to what this the pitch, chorus is. The pitch delay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, doing the thing with my hands because it's going up and down on either <laughs> side. Um, doing the yeah micro shift and um, the even tied nine ten. You know the yes. dual harmonizer. I use yeah, a lot very famous one on vocals, which is just really good for sort of sitting things back a little bit. That's um, so. Again, are you using you know, that? The space. Are you using that and a slap? yeah dependent on you know i would i always always have the the widener sort of thing going on okay yeah, yeah. um and the slap varies yeah <laughs> varies you know if it's if it's a more sort of indie thing i will be probably using some sort of slap because it really i really like the way it connects a vocal yeah with the music 
you know, it can really sit things back in and make it feel like it's part of something. If, if I want something to sort of cut through a bit more, I will definitely lean off with the delays yeah. and the reverbs. So do you find then if you are doing, so let's say like a more indie stuff, do you find if you are increasing the amount of delay you're using, are you reducing a lot of the reverb then? Or do you find you're just doing loads of everything? I mean, Again, I know these are questions that will obviously depend on the track, but we're just talking in general terms. So yeah. Yeah. So I, I, you know, things obviously vary song to song, but it tends to be for me, there's always some sort of reverb going on. There's always something like that because having something bone dry just never really works for me. You know, if I want something drier or more forward, what I'll do is I'll play with pre-delay or filtering or, you know, doing all the things. So you get the dry vocal straight away and then you get the trail maybe 60 to 100 milliseconds afterwards. I think that that would be the thing I'm playing with more than the time of the reverb or the amount of reverb. I would just definitely just play. If I want the vocal to be more forward or you know perceivably drier i would just push the reverb back with a pre-delay or filter it down or you know all of these things you can do to just sort of push it backwards they're great things you're you're saying that you know especially as the listeners are listening kind of think about the placement of the reverb more so than volume in in certain areas of the mix i think that can make a, a big big difference um in it so what are kind of your so you you mentioned about the kind of the reverb plugins you're you're using. Could you give the listeners kind of what delay plugins you tend to go for? I can. It's a very short list because um, <laughs> I'm like it's just Echo Boy, really. Echo Boy, and you know, if I remind myself, I use the Valhalla delay. Yeah, that's a great um, one. That I re- one I do like. I really one. like the. I think it's BBD. The really like the one that sounds like a reverb. Is that the is that the I red use one? That quite a lot. Yeah, it's like really nice color. Like yeah, and it's really like, like dark, like the, the sound of it. It's yeah, great. I love that thing. It's very noisy, which is yeah. another thing that keeps keeps getting me. But it's mostly Echo Boy, which is really boring, and um, Kramer tape a lot, which will yeah. be on the channel. I but the tape's obviously saturating it, it as well. Bonkers. Yeah, 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 I use that for distortion that gets used on guitars a lot. Or, you know, if I'm using something like Kramer tape, it'll be on the channel. Um, yeah. Or, or on a bus over a whole thing because it gets weird phasey stuff if you use it on things like drums and you know, yeah. stuff like that do you yeah, I've been uh, stung by that before a, a, a question that um someone was asking as well was uh they're asking about kind of reverbs and you know mm-hmm. there's this whole debate on timing your reverb to your bpm now are you a mixer that does that or do you not care at all do you mean timing the decay or timing? Uh, yeah, yeah. Like the pre uh, the decay. Oh, well, no. it could theoretically be both. I mean, reverb time. You know. Um, reverb time, no, not really. No. Um, a lot of the time I'm using presets because I'm lazy. Um, so it would just be, you know, if I, I bring something up and it doesn't feel good immediately, I'll just be like, nope, use something else. Next one. <laughs> yeah, I can't, I I'm not a tweaker. I yeah. don't. I don't really like tweaking things. I, you know, if something doesn't work immediately, I'll try something else. It's good you um, said that though. You don't something... like tweaking things because you can. I mean, on average, your mix can take me. I'd say it's between four to six hours. But if I'm tweaking, <laughs> I'll, mm. I'll be there till next week. <laughs> yeah, so, if I find myself tweaking things, it's time to go home. Like I always, I always sleep on it. You know. Yeah. I'll try and you know prep a mix in the evening, come in in the morning fresh with fresh ears, do the mix, yeah. you know, go and do some recalls or some stems or whatever in the afternoon evening. Come in the next morning, listen to it, make it twenty percent better in about ten minutes because I've got fresh ears, and then that's it. Send it. Don't tweak it. Yeah, because otherwise, otherwise I just go around in circles forever. Yeah, so I really just got to stop myself from chasing my tail. Yeah just got to kind of just do it haven't you and I, I always think to myself whenever i send a mix off if i did it on that day then it must have been you know I, i've done something you know there was a reason why i did it so just leave it kind of thing so uh yeah i think you kind of just have to kind of just push it aside sometimes don't you be like right i'm done because otherwise a mix is never done is it nothing's ever perfect so uh no no yeah. no the day i like something when it comes out or you know when it gets approved the day i'm like happy with my work i think i'll quit <laughs> so, I've, you know i've never you're never going to be 100 percent happy with something are you no of um, course not no but you know i like you say that's a whole nother podcast i know when, <laughs> when it gets approved you're like yeah i've done something right 
<laughs> it's interesting. So you're like, yeah, I mean, I guess so. Just don't, I just try not to listen to it. Just try and move on. Otherwise I'll just be picking holes. <laughs> I find that sometimes if I've been like, I, I mean, I don't know if you print in the box or you bounce offline or, or you know, mm. but I find I, I'm printing the box and sometimes I will be printing. I'll get to like the last like three seconds of the song and I'll be like, oh, did I just hear a, a crossfade that clicked? And I would like, oh, I'm going to have to start again. So now I'm just like, right, turning the volume down, let it print, send it off. Because <laughs> otherwise I'll just keep printing it, keep printing it. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm exactly the same. And that's why I print, I have a print track in my thing and I have to listen to it go down. Same as me then. I just, I just, I, I have to listen to it go down because that's the moment I hit record, I'll be like, oh, yeah, the vocal is like way too quiet or, you know, something really glaringly obvious comes out at you. Do I always bounce everything a couple of times before I'm actually sending it. Here's an interesting one then. So as you've got a print track, when you print, if you mm -hmm. notice a mistake, do you just go back a little bit and hit record and, and let it overlap and then and then obviously you glue it together or do you just go from the beginning? Because I've got this thing where I'm like, oh, no, I have to go from the beginning because I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure if it's going to gonna be completely right having two different prints in one mix. <laughs> now I'm just thinking back to all the times where I've like, spliced in a mix <laughs> which is on <laughs> yes I have I, I know it, you know if it's like a click or something I'll just drop it in you know yeah because um, a lot of the time that's not going to be the one that goes to mastering or the you know that yeah. goes out this is it, a lot of the time that's a listening copy or yeah or client ref or whatever you call it so I tend to just be pretty slap happy with like you know punching <laughs> in it's funny having this which conversation now, which it? now I'm regretting <laughs> which is now I'm do you know yeah. it's all very relatable isn't it like there's the small things we do in our business you're like oh <laughs> it's like oh you do that too <laughs> yeah what well, dirty, dirty habits <laughs> that's great so if we're going to just talk a little bit more about some certain effects as far as so you mm -hmm. we've spoken about reverbs and slaps do you ever do mm -hmm. things like uh adding a guitar amp on a vocal or or, some, or something on drums to create dirt or crunch as an effect more so than a space? This is another big one. Um, yes. A lot of the time, an amp, a lot of the time, you know, creates a big sort of phase dis disparity between the original source and, you know, the effective version. Because obviously, you know, that, that's what it does. It's emulating, you know, going through loads of tubes and a, you know, loads of stages and an out. I'm not the most technical of people, yeah. but it's, you know, emulating that and then going through a speaker and then that speaker being mic'd up, there's so much that can change along that way that if I were to use that on something like a drum kit, especially, blending it back in is always going to feel a little bit weird to me. Yeah. So not so much. I use, you know, obviously guitar amps on on guitars you yeah know, if i've got course, a di yeah. and i want you know i'll bring one in in the chorus again for like a sort of sense of depth or to bring it more forward you know that's that's another thing that is a lot better than eq for me because you're adding another sense of space and another sort of dimension to things yeah. um but when it comes to sort of drums and vocals if i'm doing things like distortion to add a sort of another layer to it it will be something like a culture vulture or decapitator or yeah you know, any any or Saturn, that's a big one. Oh, the Fab Filter um, one, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a big one for me. Um, I and I use a lot of distortion. That's a that's another big one for me. What are you using distortion on? Obviously, like guitars, but like, are you using it on vocals, drums? Are you, I mean, talk us through everything. Really? <laughs> everything. I mean, I have um, <laughs> I have um. I mean, if we you know we're talking about distortion or saturation as like a broad umbrella, you know, of I, course. I, I work with um, what's it called, the Slate Virtual Channel. I have that across yep. each channel. I've got it on my mix bus. You know, yep. I've got some sort of tapey emulation or something. There's always some sort of saturation going on on the mix bus. You know, on each channel, I maybe use Crane Song, the Phoenix plugin, you know, the really yep. old one. Yeah, yeah. I use that or like Saturn. There's always something going on because it, a lot of the time to me, it sounds a lot better when you EQ after some sort of like really gentle, like tapey thing. Yeah. It's good to have that sort of base layer foundation to build a mix on because it to me it just sounds a lot more natural you can get away with a lot more when you just have a little bit of saturation or something like helping it along a little bit interesting i always find when people always want these kind of really you know nice clean crisp mixes the way you achieve it is by adding 
dirt. <laughs> and then like you mm. say, pulling it back a little bit on the EQ or shaping it, the sound from what you've put the dirt on after it. Um, so yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. That's fantastic. Lots of I mean, distortion. pardon? All, all distortion. All distortion. Lots of distortion. Yeah, you know, it's interesting um, actually because I the headline. I used um, I was doing a vocal the other day and I felt like the chorus wasn't the the, the chorus in the vocal the cor- sorry in the chorus the vocal wasn't hitting hard enough so I just used that Waves GTR amp emulator <laughs> and I just literally by by just stuck it on in the chorus I think it was the blue one it was like the crunch and I was like oh yeah okay it sounds massive. Yeah. See, this is this is <laughs> this is exactly what I was talking about with, say, the the spring reverb. Yeah, it's when things sound rubbish that that's what that's what's <laughs> going to make something cut through. Yeah. Like you know things like lo-fi and yeah, know, lo-fi use on kicks these, and stuff. Yeah, kicks. Yeah, and, or you know on a vocal. I, a lot of the time I'll put lo-fi on the return of a reverb and I'll put it down to something like fifteen bit or yeah, you know, turn the sample rate down, mess with the aliasing or the saturation. Just again, it just makes things more visible or it will make it sound worse but in a way that sort of contrasts all of your posh sounding things yeah um mad is it we spend all this money trying to get things like perfect it's like recorded perfectly and then we come along at the end (laughs) just make everything dirty it's weird weird. i've had this conversation with a couple of people with mixing is what uh, what you're doing a lot of the time is you're starting off and you know everything sounds good and what you do is you clear it out loads and then, you know, maybe it starts to sound a bit clinical and then what <laughs> I maybe I mean, I'm going to call it reintroducing chaos um, <laughs> to I love like that. distort things <laughs> or or just just doing things to bring, you know, you make it really clean and really like everything's in its right place. And then you're like, how can I make it worse? But in a good way. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's that's a terrible way of putting it. But it's it's um, but it's I true. Tend to, tend yeah. To, yeah. To get to a certain point where you're like, OK, everything sounds really clean now. How can we sort of give it a bit more vibe and feeling and you know all of those things and a lot of the time that comes from distortion or doing things that shouldn't be right like a big stereo widener on a delay return or an effects return or like ott on a delay return it's something that would just make it a bit more edgy ott is dangerous <laughs> so we love to overuse that i love it <laughs> yeah well what? that's why they called it ott <laughs> what are you putting it on <laughs> everything <laughs> oh, don't ask me that <laughs> it's on the mix it's every on the mix. single channel <laughs> yeah i mean almost no it's on it's on the mix yeah, yeah. it's always on the mix uh, about three or four sometimes five percent if i'm feeling dangerous yeah um on effects returns i'll use it on synths yeah man it's just great i love ott um yeah i'm using a lot of ott there you go shameful confession <laughs> <laughs> I love it. It's great to see it because um, it's very kind of the, the way that you kind of sound like you're mixing is a very in a you know obviously mixing is a creative way as well as, a, as as well as a technical way. But the way you seem to be mixing, it seems to be a lot of experimenting, a lot of kind of creating kind of weird um, sonic effects within a mix to make it sound what it what it sounds like. So it's it's fantastic to see that. Are you using any other effects at all that our listeners would like to hear? Any? Or are they all secret? <laughs> um, oh, no, there's no secrets. No secrets? Um, there's no secrets. I'm not good. <laughs> we're not, we're not quite, we're not serving yet, you know. Um, <laughs> um, I, I really like, what do I like? I really like mangled verb. Have you used that? It's even tied. Okay, I haven't used that. It's one. like a distorted reverb thing. It's on my sort of wildcard okay. send, uh, like inactive. It's just like a re- it's just, just like distorted reverb, and it's awesome. Yeah, that's definitely one you should try. Mangled. It's called mangled verb, and it Ma- looks like mangled a verb. Pedal. Okay, even tides. I mean, the even tide bundle in general is just amazing. Um, yeah, things like the nine ten, the H three thousand, just things that would do weird stuff or things that would do things that are unpredictable. I tend to, I try to reach for those things as much as I can because a lot of the times you'll get a production in and it'll be pretty clinical. Yeah. Or it'll be a mess. So, you know, you you clean it up loads or something. You know, it's, it's bringing things back into that lane of having vibe and edge and feeling, but it's all considered. I think that's that's the most important thing. Fantastic. And do you find that when you are getting productions to mix, are you using 
a lot of the time they're dry stems or they're wet stems as far as effects go do you find that you're I, using more i used yeah. to be a lot more like no you know i use the dry stems and you know i can i can improve it i can improve it you know i listen to the wet stem and you know i'll be like oh maybe they've done this so i like try and do it i'm like well, i can do it better but you know i always just personally i was always just digging myself holes so i, I would just use as much wet stems as i possibly can yeah that's you know, the same as me it, yeah i as long as i've got a dry lead vocal i'm happy if it's come from a you know producer i've worked with a lot or someone new that i think you know depending on what i think of the the quality of the production i will be starting from wet stems you know even down to the vocal if needs be um preferably yeah. i would have the vocal dry even if it's got compression and whatnot on it i'd like to have the effect separate but i mean if that's not possible or um or the vocal sounds so specific, which has happened to me recently. You know, people send things through. I had a guy recently who was using guitar rig on his lead vocal, and I was like, "Oh, you know, you could send me <laughs> guitar rig. a screen." I, yeah, I mean, yeah, mate. <laughs> <laughs> we see um, all sorts. I mean, it sounded, it, I was just gonna say this. It sounded really good. It sounded really good. Because I was like, you know, maybe you could send me the the dry vocal, and then you know your session with the guitar rig in, and I can clean up the vocal and send it back through and do all of this, and you know, it just ends up sounding different, and they don't like it. So you know, they've yeah. made that bed and now i'm gonna sleep in it <laughs> so I'll, you know i'll be going in on on the audio file with d click and you know spot bits of eq just to make things cleaner or you know to to, to make it so i can actually mix it you know i'll yeah. spend quite a couple of hours on the prep and making sure stuff sounds good before i start mixing it so that, that's when i'll go in and detail and then maybe at the end i'll you know do another comb over and make sure i've caught all of the bits of you know horrible stuff that you don't want in your record yeah yeah but yeah wet, wet stems what about you what's your what's your opinion i i tend to go wet stems mainly apart again similar to you apart from like the main elements like a vocal for example a lot mm. of the time i would want to control certain elements of that um depending on how the mix is and that may change during the mix which is why i prefer to work from dry however mm. one thing is again similar kind of story to you i used to be the same i used to always want dry stems because yes you know i'm a mixer i can make this better because you know we're proud of ourselves and all, all of that sort of stuff yeah and you realize especially <laughs> the older you get and the more experience you get is to kind of you're not you know, you need to really respect that that rough mix. And I always say this to people, that the producer, the artist, they have been living with that rough mix um, for a long time. And like what you said, Josh, why change it to then create more work for yourself in the long run? And I find that by using the wet stems, um, they, you know, it's amazing. I can mix it quicker. I get less revisions. And everyone seems to be pretty happy. And normally the revisions tend to be very small things. And, and you know, instead of a revision being like, I don't like the vocal sound, the revision is, can you turn that word up on verse two kind yeah, of thing? Like, yes, yes, I can do that. Yeah, yeah. Um, agreed, totally. So um, I definitely think for all just, the listeners, you know, not, if you can do it from the wet as well, you know. Yeah, I, I would, you know, I definitely do my best work in the confines of what someone else has already done. Because it's like you said, you know, you you experiment with things. You can go so far when you have that flexibility of being able to, you know, get the wet stem and you've got the dry stem and you can, you know, there's something you can do. Yeah. You can just end up in a world of your own, which is so far away from the intention of the producer, of the artist, of what was sort of, you know, of what happened in the room on the day. You know, it's not... Yeah, a lot of the time it's not your job or my job or whoever's job to be like, well, your guitar sounds not very good in the verse. I'm going to reamp it, and it's going to be way better. Like yeah. nobody cares. <laughs> like just you know, as much as I wish they did, they don't. Yeah. So I'm just you know, I'm just trying to make sure. Yeah. I'm best servicing the what I've been sent as a whole rather than all the individual things, and you know, start where they left off is obviously the best way to go about that for me. Of course, of course, and it's interesting said about the reamping because there is, you know, one thing I do find I do a lot is normally with bass guitar, especially when it's DI, unless I get sent a bass amp, I always tend to put is it the UAD Ampeg? I think it is the. Is it, I always tend to just use that, but I don't do anything with it. I just put the plug in on, and it just sounds good. It's awesome. That, yeah, that's kind of I. You know, that's the only thing I tend to do, even if the stem is 
kind of wet, I guess, with DI if it's already compressed, I will stick that on yeah. on anyway. Um, a lot of the time I'll sort of yeah. malt things. Like if it's a DI, I'll have the DI and then I'll duplicate it and send it through an amp and then commit the amp and then, you know, check how it's yeah, phasing with each blend. other, which is really important. Um, yeah, a bit of a blend and then maybe I'll do something on the bus. But I mean, a big thing for me with bass, which is there's another like really dirty habit, is um, CLA bass. That is, that is a great plug-in though. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> it's so good do you just stick I mean, that on all your bass DIs <laughs> yeah I mean a lot of the time yeah I'll put Amazing. CLA bass on stuff I mean it's you know all of these like really dirty habit things. Like, CLA vocals is used on every mix without fail I'm glad you except said for, that except for, except for not except for sometimes you know when you don't use it but most of the time it's there I feel like a lot of people kind of keep that one secret, don't they? Because they're like, oh, I haven't used a CLA vocal. But at the end of the day, and this goes back to my point, if it sounds good, it is good. I don't care how somebody's got to that sound. It's all about, is the artist happy? And is the producer happy? And whoever their team is. And if they're happy and the audience like it, then I couldn't care less what you use. <laughs> so, yeah, you know, it's, yeah. it's so CLA true, vocals. isn't it? You know, And I love presets as well. I will literally go to presets on any plugin and use any because i know that you know there's a lot of people that are like no i don't use presets <laughs> yeah i mean i'm i use presets you know i've got presets in my template on my mix but obviously you know things change but as a starting point yeah you know I, I i changed the default of plugins to be what i would use it for because a lot of the time i will use it for one thing yeah you know say so like our, our compressor is i have a setting that i use on vocals that i've sort of arrived at and that's just my default now because that's where i want to start from yeah. i don't want to spend ages like getting it back to where it was before um that's so, the yeah, thing there's and a you lot have of, to there's think, a lot that it's just workflow isn't it and, and yeah yeah and you have to think about your time as well because obviously you know you, you as a mixer you obviously you're you know in demand um and especially when you're talented like yourself you know a lot of people want a lot of tracks mixed by you and so therefore you know you don't really have the time to spend a week trying to find a reverb you kind of just have to naturally get to it. So definitely presets, templates, all that kind of stuff, I would highly recommend. Um, you know, me and Josh both use them. So for the people listening, if you don't use them, then I would recommend it. Um, yeah, and I think the, the thing to add with templates is it's not a template per se. Uh, so, you know, it's, it changes the sound of things, but, you know, I will have things that I generally have on my mix bus. You know, there's, yeah, it's starting to look pretty static these days things like the mix bus or the effects returns or the you know the group buses there's always yeah. one or two things that is just constant because i just really like what it does and it's not particularly invasive so you know having things like that that you can reach for really quickly yeah is obviously really really helpful as, a, as opposed to you know sending things through a template that already has processing yeah. on it and just pushing it and being like cool it's done <laughs> um, i'm you know i'm considering it a little bit it's just of course you arrive at. <laughs> we are getting <laughs> the money <laughs> yeah 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 i'm not doing it in 10 minutes <laughs> <laughs> um but yeah well thank you so much josh for coming on and i just you no, know i want to ask you one final question for the listeners what would you tell your young self that you now know that you wish you did back then? Um, that was a very big I don't, question. I don't, I, don't, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear, but yeah, I guess you can believe. <laughs> I definitely have been. I would just say, chill the fuck out, man. <laughs> like, <laughs> I love just, that. Just, just chill. Like, don't, you know, you don't need to go out of your way to impress people by, you know, being super talented or being you know, amazing at the job. What you've, what you've got to do is show up, be nice to people, you know, don't get in the way when you're an assistant and just work hard and just be patient. And I wish someone had told me that sooner. Or I wish I had the, you know, the sort of brains to work it out for myself. But you yeah. just need to just hang in there. And Experience it, yeah. Just keep, you know, just try your best to work hard and get on with it because i think that's the most important thing rather than being talented or being you know the best or being you know any of these things or being you know fun on a night out or just you know show up work hard be nice to people and you know try your best and that's what we can do fantastic well josh thank you so much for taking your time to come on um no thanks for really having enjoyed me. it thank you